Before I get rolling this morning, I wanted to share with you uh, a funny experience I had this morning. I got, uh, as many of you probably did, an email in my inbox uh, that said, uh, the title of which was Service Reminder, in bold letters, Service Reminder, and right underneath it, in smaller letters, the words, you will be disappointed. And I thought, well, there you go. It's probably accurate. So uh, here we go. We'll give it a try. You may have heard of a book by Dr. Seuss, and the title is, Oh, the Places You'll Go. It's given to college graduates on their big day. It's uh, given often as a gift at the start of a new job. It's got some very encouraging lines like, kid, you'll move mountains. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. And it goes on, uh, and will you succeed? Yes, you will. Yes, indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. To which some of us who've lived in the world for a while might say, now wait just a minute. A success rate of 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed? Dr. Seuss, we might argue, that all sounds fantastic, but come on, this book isn't describing the life that I've known, the, the one with failures in it, with doubt, the life with crushing heartbreak. So I have in mind an alternative book that one could give as a gift to new graduates or others at the exciting threshold of a new chapter of life, a journey in which they're about to depart. It's, a more, it's more tempered than, oh, the places you'll go. The title of this new book would be, You Will Be Disappointed. Not much is guaranteed to us in this life, but if we live long enough, if we give our heart to something or someone, if we try as hard as we can, and if we keep our dreams alive, almost always, dare I say, 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed, you will be disappointed. You will run into that wall. The career path you'd prepared for, for so long, dissipates before you like so much fog. The relationship falls apart. Or maybe it's the friendship where you thought you could count on someone to have your back only to discover with a shock that it just wasn't the case. Congregations are excellent places to find disappointment. I mean, coming in through the door, what expectations are raised? Finally, a community free of people of judgment, free of human foible. And then in time, a congregation is revealed to be, at best, a roiling beehive of imperfection. And don't get me started when it comes to ministers. Those smooth-talking professional people-pleasers, disappointments galore. Sometimes disappointment arrives when we have the thing in our grasp, the relationship, the job, the perfect setup, and then lose it. But then sometimes disappointment drops on us even before we get what we want, hoping things will blossom into a certain kind of flourishing that they haven't yet blossomed into, that will finally become who we've been meant to become, this wishing and hoping for this thing that hasn't yet come into our lives can thrum so strongly within us that we can feel its presence. We can almost taste it. And then the news ha comes didn't happen. This is it. No court of appeals. Again, that high wall. So high we can't see over it, can't see around it, can't see anything actually, but the wall itself right before us, final, definite, like the period at the end of a sentence, after all the giddy clarity of expectation, hitting the wall is not unlike getting lost. The scholar of Hebrew scriptures, Walter Brueggemann, says that the human life is often found in one of three conditions, orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. With orientation, we know where we are, we know where we're going, we know who we are, we know what we're about, that's orientation. In the next phase, disorientation, all of that former coherence falls apart, just unravels. And the third phase, he says, reorientation, is not a return 
to the first former state. It's not a matter of rewinding the tape. Instead, reorientation comes when we've moved on through the wilderness of disorientation to continue the journey now stronger and wiser. But back here at the wall of disappointment and disorientation, how exactly does one do that? When we have found ourselves disappointed, how do we then become reappointed? Some of us in some way have been waiting at the wall of disappointment for a very long time with that question, how to move through the wall, how to go on after living after the universe, fate or God has given us and delivered a very clear no. Thinking about that conversation, uh, thinking about that reminded me of a story from when I was 23. I was living in Austin, Texas, where I had moved as a college dropout to sing in a punk band. Two friends and I volunteered for an organization called Bikes Not Bombs to drive a truckload of 200 bicycles from Austin, Texas to Leon, Nicaragua for a donation to rural teachers. To make a long story short, or at least a little less long, we set off headed south to the Mexico border and then on from there. Throughout Mexico, one strategy of traffic control is the use of what they call topes. A tope is essentially an enormous speed bump. Like, think of a speed bump and then multiply it about five times. That's a tope. So you had to slow to a crawl so the old truck and trailer could ease over it before then regaining speed, by which I mean about 45 miles an hour tops. In any case, our journey was marked by disaster after disaster, one involving young soldiers with machine guns, another involving a broken water pump in the middle of nowhere. But we kept on, the three of us pressed together in the hot, tight cab of that giant old truck with a mountain of bicycles clanging just behind. And then came the day when I was at the wheel, going at the breakneck speed of 45 miles an hour, which for this truck was very fast, down an old country road in the middle of nowhere, yellow farmland stretching out around us either side. I remember being very happy that day. We were listening to Fugazi, one of my favorite punk bands on the boombox. A roadside group of kids looked up, their eyes wide, and I waved down from them to them, full of joy. And just at that moment, bang! The truck and the trailer, our whole three-ton contraption, hit something and stopped dead. We hopped out, looked around. I had hit a tope, full speed. And now the undercarriage of the truck had separated from the rest of it. It lay there in the road like a tail. And I say to this point, we had overcome many things, but the truck literally coming apart in two pieces did not seem a problem one could overcome. After all we'd been through, it looked like we'd finally met our match with this overgrown speed bump, this unpainted tope. Now I tell people that I've experienced at least one miracle in my life, and this is when it happened on the side of this road. As we stood around, hands on hips, in all the uh, ill-equipped wisdom of our 23 years, looking upon the wreckage of our truck, with the mountain of bicycles and the trailer behind it, suddenly one of the children who'd been watching and must have disappeared returned with an old man. This old man was not a wizard. He was a welder and his roadside welding shop was only 40 yards down the road. Somehow we humped that broken vehicle down that 40 yards, scraping the undercarriage the whole way. The welder literally picked up a few pieces of cast off iron from the dust of his scrapyard and went to work. And in under two hours, we were back on the road. As I say, if I've got a miracle story to tell, this is it. There is no way I can explain the good fortune to have that kind of accident in that kind of spot. What I had understood without question to be the end of our journey, to put an end to it all after all we'd been through, was as it turned out, only a speed bump. Not a wall, a speed bump. I would like to propose that observation in light of this morning's topic, the disappointment we have been sure is a wall, the wall we've perhaps been standing under a long time upon further reflection may only be a speed bump. 
to shrink it down from an impassable wall to a speed bump, even a large one, may seem at first to disrespect the impact we have felt, the experience of shock, of loss in the disappointment. Only a speed bump we might protest, but this meant everything to me. It's important to note that any resistance, to, it's important to note any resistance to letting go of disappointment. That might seem strange to say because who on earth would want to hang on to disappointment? But it's not the disappointment we want to hang on to. We want to hang on often to the importance of our experience, to how badly it hurt and what that meant to us. I once knew a woman who had not been admitted to a PhD program because she was a woman. It was outright sexism, no question about it. 40 years later, she still felt the sting of it, still spoke of it often. A cynic might say, come on, get over it. But look, if she had let go of that story, who was there in the world all of those years later to bear witness to the actual injustice she had known? She had made herself into a vehicle, a steward, a caretaker of that experience. To let go would have been to let that admissions committee win once and for all with no consequences. Holding on to the hurt in this sense was an act of justice. Some of us holding on to the disappointment in our own lives may be in somewhat the same position. If we moved on, if we let go, well then, who would remember? So I want to say that as you consider moving on beyond the disappointment you felt, the loss, the surprise, the letdown, whatever it is, to move beyond it is not to dismiss it, nor to let it go. It is only to hold it with a different sense of perspective, to hold it with a different proportion, to not allow disappointment to have the last word. One way to think of it is to say this, your story is bigger than your situation. And it may have been that what you were hoping for was pinned to the outcome of some situation, the job, the relationship, the friendship, the way of life, but that life turned out to be working not only on your situation, but instead that life was working on you. So there comes the question, which I believe is of utmost spiritual worth. Will you be defined by your situation or by your story? Of course, they're not unrelated. Your story is the unfolding process of how you respond to your situations one after the other. At first, to experience the disruption and pain of the loss of what we've wanted, to feel that disappointment, is honest and brave. Those who meet disappointment only to shrug it off and dismiss it are trying a short-term duct tape and bailing wire solution that won't last very long. It's important to feel it, to experience it fully. But then, as we feel it, it's useful to notice that the loss we experience is not the loss of reality, but the loss of our expectation. The loss of our expectation, a creation of the mind, an understandable one, sure, but only in the mind. What has happened in reality is what has happened. So as I process disappointment, I am challenged to shift from my attachment to the expectation of what I wanted, now to a relationship with what actually is, to the world, to this life, to the condition of acceptance. Walter Brueggemann might say that if disappointment has put us in a state of disorientation, it is this shift from refusing to accept what has happened to some form of acceptance that begins to return us and start us on our way toward reorientation. But if we can recognize what has happened as reality, if we can come to accept it, we're faced with a question, well, what now? How will we integrate this unwanted thing so at odds with our expectations? What part will it play in our life moving on? This is where the difference between a wall and a speed bump comes in, the speed bump of our situation in light of the longer road of our story. 
Today's reading from Ecclesiastes says that while God has laid burdens upon humanity, God has also placed eternity in the human heart. A speed bump is the burden, but your story is part of unfolding eternity. The universalist conviction that love conquers all is not the promise that life won't bring any pain. It is instead the idea that nothing ultimately goes to waste, that even the greatest loss can in time be put to the purpose of love. You might think of it as if the universe was only a vast composting process, wherein what had been discarded now, converted, can put forth new life. So the spiritual question is not, how will you roll over the speed bump and truck on unaffected? The spiritual question is, how will you put your disappointment to work? How will you use it in the service of love? I know many who have suffered love and then who have suffered loss and then harness that loss into the power of compassion. I know many who've experienced unimaginable disappointment, who've then converted it into fuel for new motivation. You may know people who use their disappointment as information about how the world is in order to proceed with more wisdom, more savvy as they very forth. There's a corny line which says, a setback is only a setup for a comeback. It's corny, I told you. But viewed in spiritual terms, perhaps there's some useful challenge in it. You will be disappointed. You will hope for A, work for A, dream of A, expect A, and then to your surprise, what will happen is B. Not A, but B. The truck you've been traveling in will fall apart. This will happen in our new relationship as minister and congregation. It will happen in life, as Dr. Seuss will say, 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. And at that moment when you find yourself facing the realization that your expectation is not the same as the truth in the world, you will have a decision. Will you stay there in disappointment or will you seek out reappointment? Will you let it be a wall or see it as a speed bump? Will you take up residence in disorientation or will you find a way to use disappointment to fuel your pathway toward reorientation? Will you let loss become the compost of a new, richer life? In other words, will you in the end be defined by your situation or by your larger story? The difference is up to you. In the end, the key is not the event nor in the lost expectation. The key in the end is how you choose to respond.